Welcome back, ghouls and ghouls. Remember, if you enjoy these videos, please hit that like button, share these videos with your friends. If you really enjoy what you see, Hulk smash that subscribe button. But now, it is time to get into Hero Illustrated. Now, back in the day, there was Wizard Magazine, right? And it was kind of revolutionary, at least to, you know, most of us who are like eight to 12 years old. And <laughs> I don't know. When I first came across Wizard, I thought it was going to be this font of comic book knowledge and all this great stuff, but it didn't really work out that way. Uh, my local shop did not like Wizard. So they did not carry Hero Illustrated at all because Hero Illustrated never sold like Wizard and they just couldn't be bothered. Now, I picked up this sealed first issue and I thought we would just pop this out, see what was in there, flip through, talk about it, have a little bit of fun with a nice short dive. So Hero Illustrated was fairly famous, notorious. Like their, one of their big shticks, right, was... Uh, I guess it doesn't say it on here. Um, oh yeah, exclusive foil Ashcan comics inside. Now, Ashcan comics were really big at the time and uh, it was like the boom, you know, the image boom and everybody, everybody had freaking Ashcans out. Uh, there are some really, most of them are giveaways. Like uh, you, you try finding that Black Max. Whew. Yeah, you were talking about some dollars. So hero illustrated to compete with wizard right first of all you got a hollow foil cover bam oh man we're just jumping off the shelves anyway but every issue actually did come with quite a bit of stuff um as as i remember there were even videos that came later though i think you might have had to pay for those i'm not sure anyway so in this one we have a wonderful ultraverse card i remember this series awful just terrible garbage this was pretty cool actually this is from the jurassic park series and if you read the back it's kind of funny because the jurassic park series is by tops and really all it is is reprints of stills from the movie but there are randomly inserted i think there's like six or twelve comic book artist cards and this is an art adams card and i am super partial to art adams i thought it was pretty cool barbed wire now this issue is going to be getting into some interesting stuff because Hero Illustrated, they didn't just... If you don't know about Wizard, the guy who started it, Garib Seamus, was actually at the very first ever Image Comics meeting. And they were highly vested in Image. Hero kind of makes more of an attempt to tell things as they are. And one of the things that they cover in this that I really hadn't read a lot about and still don't read a lot about is the Dark Horse launch that was going on for a shared continuity. Um, and that's a barbed wire card. Nobody cares about barbed wire, except for those, uh, well, I think Adam Hughes did a couple, couple of uh, covers for them. Uh, so X-Men, I was like, wow, that's a really lame poster, but actually pretty sweet Greg Capullo. I think it's Greg Capullo. I think that's who that is. I. And terrible with signatures. Normally, I thought Capullo put his name on stuff, but I, I don't know who else that would be. I guess, though, maybe Capullo actually might have already been over at uh, Image. Anyway, so we got a Star Trek. Uh, we get two ash cans with this. This really isn't an ash can, though. I don't even know what to call this. Mostly, this is like uh, a behind the scenes sneak peek. They say inside the actual issue that there's going to be a second part to this. So I assume that there was just too much behind the scenes stuff. It couldn't fit it into the ash can format. And so later on, they put more of the story in here. Mostly it's just interviews. And okay, I'm not a big Star Trek guy, to be very honest. But uh, Deep Space Nine, I do love that series. The art, super lackluster to me. Um, this is like a sketch of the original character. And that's the one page of comic that you get and it looks atrocious i mean even by 1993 standards like that is some sadness this however is cool batman grendel so today there is about 50 people who remember this series i think and mostly this series is remembered because 
there is a variant edition of this ash can. I think it has a silver background. It is signed by Matt Wagner. The only way you could get it was by one of the uh, contests in this issue. There was, I think, 25 of them. Those comics go for some mad cash, man. They are ghosts. This, however, pretty cool. I'm into Matt Wagner, though. I guess maybe I'm a little bit partial. It's really neat. There's not a super lot of the comic in here. What is cool is it is presented in the traditional black and white ash can format. There's uh, some concepts, a little bit of talking about... Um, I guess there was some... This was actually really interesting. It's short, but it's also kind of like the uh, the wizard supplemental stuff. As a kid, I don't think I read deep enough into it or knew, maybe knew enough to get the breadth of knowledge that these little tiny like little snippets have, but it's really cool. Um, Matt Wagner actually talks about, I guess he'd written this series before. He'd written it one time and DC just didn't like what he did with Batman. And he went and he says he talked to Denny O'Neill and Denny O'Neill really explained uh, the difference between Superman and Batman, which was something that he thought uh, that that Wagner was was missing. And Wagner really took it to heart. I'm a big fan of this series. I thought it was very well written. I think the art is absolutely astounding. That's another cool thing. Uh, he talks a little bit about how uh, the art came to be and what the influences are on on the art. Um, and again, mostly uh, that was that was uh, um, Denny O'Neill, and he was really into uh, Bill Finger and uh, Dick Sprang and stuff. Uh, it, it was pretty, this was a good read. It's really short. But actually, there's some cool, like, background information on the comic, which is something you normally don't find. Then you get this short little, I think it's like five-page black and white preview. I have always thought that Wagner's art probably looks much better in black and white. But uh, I don't know, maybe I'm alone there. I thought uh, this series was really great. Most people don't talk about it now. It's nothing groundbreaking or anything, but it is super cheap. And if you like Matt Wagner, like uh, Mage, which I still think Mage is just one of those, you know, Mage is, people don't talk about that series. There's a reason Mage has been going on for, what, 30 years now? Because that series is amazing. And Matt Wagner really does. He's he's doing something different, cool, and unique. Uh, Batman Grendel was really cool. The... um. The ghost version of this that you could only get by winning a competition was one of the copious amounts of competitions in this magazine. Like even on the uh, like little polymer sleeve, you've got uh, you could also win an amazing Spider-Man number one, like right on the cover, right? Well, they don't tell you you can win an amazing Fantasy 15. Like there are some insane giveaways in here. I'm sure that was probably only for the first issue, but still, holy God. Um, publisher's note, this was weird. I don't know if he actually meant it, but they solicit, they're like, if, you, if there's anything you like, please tell us about it. If there's anything you don't like about the magazine, please write in and let us know, because if we think you're correct, we'll take it to heart. And they're really... Throughout this, they're encouraging interaction with the fan base, which is something that uh, Wizard was really big on. But I don't think they ever paid full fan service. And it seemed, at least in this first issue, Man Hero is going all out. Uh, I, I love Mr. T. I actually have that gold edition of Mr. T and the signed Dynamic Forces. If anybody has one of the press packets that they gave out, one of the folders that had the, uh, uh, man, I need the, I need one of those. I, re I refuse to pay $50 for it, but I do need one. Um, so, tons of image ads. There is a interview with Todd McFarlane in this, and they also talk to Eric Larson. Uh, it's actually a pretty good Larson interview. I love Eric Larson, though. So maybe I'm a little bit... Uh, 
uh, biased on that one. A lot of image ads, there's, they talk to Todd McFarlane. One thing that was cool to me, they do not go the image route of, okay, yeah, we're just going to basically worship at the altar of image. They have a review section in here, and when we get to it, whoo, man, do they rip into some of those image comics. They they ask uh, Todd McFarlane some very interesting questions. Uh, there is a number of ugh, filler... I don't even know what it call. They're not even really filler articles. I just don't think they knew what they were doing with the magazine quite yet. There are some very cool ideas, though. My favorite was the Ashcan Comics Golden Age to Present. Um, I wish it was more in depth, but it actually gives you like as far as before Wikipedia, which is I, essentially this is like a write up of what you would read on Wikipedia with a very few uh, less details which is really cool. Um, these are letters to the editors. This is all crap I really don't want to get into because they're talking about uh, the, the previews. I don't trust any of these letters because back in the day especially, you just sent this stuff to people who are not going to be critical. None of this stuff is hypercritical. Obviously, they're going to throw in some stuff like, oh, you should probably change this. No, nah, whatever. They do, however, go out of their way. And I would, I'm probably going to pick up some more if I can get these cheap. Uh, probably pick up some more of these later in the run to see were they still pushing this level of interaction? Because they really want people to write in. I thought that was cool. Plasm, Warriors of Plasm. Man, that is just a sad story. If you don't know about the Warriors of Plasm, Good God. Like, I hate Jim Shooter. Do not get me wrong. Like, you you probably heard of me refer to him as essentially like the Antichrist. But like, dude, I feel bad for him on uh, some stuff that went down. And definitely, Plasm was one of them. So, uh, okay. So I'm not going to leave you guys hanging like a, like a dick. Marvel basically came in and squashed everything they had to change the name. They went to court. They spent a ton of time and money in court. Eventually won because Marvel, as always, were just being hose bags. And, well, by that time, the uh, young publisher was out of money and ended up going completely bankrupt, as was Marvel's won't. So, Pitt... He is going to be showing up a bunch in this issue. I thought it was very interesting. The one thing that I will say about Hero is they do take, as I said, a fairly critical look at Image Comics. They are worshiping at the altar of Dale Keown's art. They put Pitt in the Ashcan uh, article. They put Pitt in a couple of articles about Image but not the Max. Like, I don't know if they didn't understand the Max or they thought that literally Sam Keith, or they didn't like Sam Keith's art or what, but it, it, they, it, we'll get into that. They hammer on that series. It kind of pissed me off, to be honest, reading this. I kept being like, okay, so you guys hammer the, uh, cause like I said, the, the, uh, darker image ash can is the, the, uh, header for that, for the ash can article. And you would think like, oh, Max and like they literally they in the spec section, like investment. In, anyway, yeah, we'll get there. So this is the first uh, letter of competition that they're having. You, you, you know, we all know this from Wizard. You drew your art. You sent it in. If it was good, they published it. Uh, Wizard went a step beyond with the actual like full pages. They had spreads at some point. Some really famous guys showed up in Wizard actually. It was pretty cool. If you ever uh, check out the cartoonist Kayfabe channel, they were at one point going chronologically through. I don't know if they ever actually hit any of the issues that had uh, the more famous artists, but they would give away, you know, you got like a Wizard subscription or some cool kind, you know, like a signed spawn one cool okay you know it's 1993 and everybody wants to spawn one this you get a fucking hulk number one an incredible hulk number one the runners up get like a uh unity zero and i think it's the red version 
and um that that comic was going for like 150 bucks they have some berserker like truly i want to know where the money for some of these giveaways came from how much cash they spent on the actual who backed this crap that's what i want to know like did someone who owned a comic shop back this um first ad here for the dark horse universe launching there is for and i didn't know jack crap about this dark horse universe going into this issue they don't have like enormous write-ups or anything but they have such good well-written concise write-ups that i actually was like oh well i now know what's going on with x that i own god probably like 25 issues no they didn't put 25 out but every x issue that ever had a frank miller comic well yeah i was young and i loved sin city and i knew i had to have a frank miller cover i didn't read those an ad for donna matrix now this is pretty cool it's the first ever completely 3d rendered comic book and i'm pretty sure it's by the guy who did the original first ever all computer generated comic book don't remember reading all of donna matrix and i'm pretty sure there's a reason for that uh not saying i highly recommend going out for uh you know hunting it down but it is cool that with the you know the early you got the image ads and then you got you know an image dude on uh you pit i say image dude image dude brah um oh yeah and see and signed a numbered image ash cans like these things were everywhere ash cans were everywhere and that was one of the big things that hero played into but um so we got this used to be something i love to see you don't see it anymore this is crappy xerox reproductions i think they're called photo stats in a lot of cases i don't know if these are actually photo stats but they're crappy xerox reproductions of the line art that's going to be these comics i used to love to see these i collect a lot of these old um, advanced magazines that didn't have the money or direct contact with marvel and dc to get the actual full resolutions uh zero if, basically they had to fax them to you or mail you photos copies of them and uh i really love that you can see the crappy crappy just terrible xerox stuff um speaking of jim shooter hey man pretty sure that's jim shooter yeah I, I, that's that his ugly mug so hero hero breaking the big news here about the the new batman it's gonna be incredible it's gonna be great and uh they got no details when they were going to press i love reading this old stuff because they're like by the time we went to press there were no details available and they're I, one thing looking back on these that i always find highly amusing is they're just talking about joe cusada this you know he's redesigning batman it's gonna be the greatest thing ever and like silently right over here you got this magneto illustration by bill sinkevich which has become immortal this is just like one of those iconic uh he did a series of these right around this time that ended up on the pizza hut uh trading cards that were packaged with the pizza hut vhs tapes of x-men the animated series which you may or may not be able to see on my shelf behind me in uh, my longer stuff so this is a rundown of uh basically what's going on in the news big section of it is uh batman because that's obviously like the big news batman's going to be changing there are no details but they do know that uh, bane and azrael are going to be involved Ooh, okay then we've got the daredevil redesign you got a couple of different possible redesigns for daredevil i'm not sure i've seen uh this one or this one before i know i've seen this is the one that they ended up going with which is the reason you got the side profile but these definitely were going for more of like a cyberpunk feel which is something i don't know um they're talking about uh they're doing this uh mall tour because they're i think trying to be hipper than wizard they're like we're not just doing conventions we're going to a mall man in their interview when they were talking to todd mcfarlane apparently todd mcfarlane i don't know if he like actually they're making it out like oh no you let the beans slip about that uh batman spawn interview one thing that is interesting is they do mention that uh 
in negotiations that it's likely that Todd McFarlane is going to have complete creative control over the one shot. And for anybody who doesn't know, there's a Batman spawn and a spawn Batman and McFarlane made a very strong, he's the only image founding father that made this uh, vow never to work with Marvel or DC again for everybody hates Rob Liefeld and Jim Lee for going back to work. They never said they weren't going to go back. Um, even Eric Larson and Jim Valentino left very amicably from Marvel before image blew up and Marvel kind of, you know, started trying to get a real hard on for them, but it, it, they left on very amicably. Todd McFarlane did not. Todd McFarlane venomously despises freaking Marvel and he does not like DC anymore. So when they put out Spawn Batman and Batman Spawn, and there's a reason that there's two of them, Image got to publish one and DC got to publish one. And basically, I think the deal was short of like Batman, you know, going out and like, I don't know, Viking pillaging a town or something like literally he could basically do whatever he wanted with Batman and everybody was really hyped up about it. And basically what he did was give Batman, uh, um, like, uh, mech, mech suit gloves, robot gloves to, to punch things. It was, uh, slightly underwhelming. Um, so X-Men 2099 getting pushed back again. It's one of the most highly anticipated series of 1993 from Marvel. That's what Marvel had going on in 1993, folks. Yeah. And, and, and who is the other big, right on the other page, who do we got? Night Thrasher. Woo, fresh out of the pages of New Warriors. And no, that is not a dig at New, York, New Warriors. I actually really like New Warriors. The writing on that series is absolutely just the writing is just ridiculously better than it should be. And honestly, for a character that deals with anything that is socially relevant, Silhouette is still one of my favorite freaking characters of all time. Um, let's see. Oh, this is kind of interesting. There is a comic locating service. It's a one, I think it's a 1-800 number even. Yeah. Yeah, you call and if you're on vacation or you just don't have a local shop, if you register with Hero, you can have your business uh, given out. You just call in and they say you give them like your uh, zip code, what city you're in, and then they give you, hey, this is where you can go get comics. That's pretty hit, man. This is before uh, the internet where you could look up stuff. I know that sounds, I'm sure that's going to sound ridiculously stupid to most people under like 95. But uh, seriously, man, like back in the day, you couldn't, it, there was no way to find these things. I remember reading ads in these, hoping to see like an Illinois down at the bottom, like in Illinois that wasn't in Chicago. Uh, you never did, but I always hoped. They're also, Hero is giving away an Amazing Fantasy 15. I mean, so far we've got Incredible Hulk 1. We've got an Amazing Fantasy 15, and we are 24 pages in. Holy Jesus. I mean, for real. What is going on? Okay, so this is one of my all-time favorite things, so I got to point it out. They are talking about Mask of the Phantasm. Now, Mask of the Phantasm, I think, doesn't even have a name at this point. It is just a untitled Warner Brother project that is going to be spun off from Batman the Animated Series due to its immense popularity, and um, it's going to be going to theaters. Now, for anybody who doesn't know, which is probably most of the people watching this because you're not ancient like I am, that movie did... Uh, let me rephrase it. That movie did terribly at the theaters. Now, today... Batman the Animated Series, still critically heralded as one of the best comic book uh, inspired pieces ever and adaptations of comic books in general, probably widely considered to be the best adaptation all around of Batman 
ever done. Now, uh, at the time, it was extremely popular and Warner Brothers make, they made a very ballsy push to throw it into theaters and it blew up in their face. It did terribly. Eventually on Cartoon, I believe, it was the Cartoon Network re-airing of that right around Christmas or something. And um, that's where most of us saw it. And I remember I got so lucky because the Dollar Theater had Mask of the Phantasm. And man, I think I saw that movie like nine times at the theater. It was so awesome to see on the big screen. They talk about how it is going to be very true to the Batman the Animated Series, Bruce Timm stuff, and how really the only stuff they're going to change is adding a little bit more frames to make the animation more fluid and uh, tightening down the... Uh, character designs make them a little bit more detailed and adding some CGI stuff, which is what they did. Um, and if you have not seen Mask of the Phantasm, by the way, I, I cannot recommend that enough. Thank God Warner Brothers finally put that movie out on Blu-ray not too long ago as part of the Warner Brothers archive. So you can buy that on demand on Blu-ray. And uh, I think you can also get it in a uh, double set with uh, Sub-Zero on Blu-ray, which, uh, man, Sub-Zero is awesome. It's kind of a follow-up to the legacy that uh, they created on Batman the Animated Series with uh, Mr. Freeze. Because before Batman the Animated Series, Mr. Freeze was just, he really was kind of a jokey, forgotten rogue. He was um, the Riddler. Nobody took him seriously for a long time. And, and he was just... He had been, I think his name was originally actually was Sub-Zero or Mr. Zero. Oh, man, that, I should probably have looked that up. But anyway, you know, they, they, he had been retooled several times with no success. And Batman the Animated Series, who they absolutely reinvented that character. And if you like Mr. Freeze, it is only because of Bruce Timm. So also check out Sub-Zero because that's essentially their feature-length follow-up to that whole legacy. One of the cool things, this is filled with Image Comics stuff because Image Comics is just launching. However, they do an inordinate amount of talking about Dark Horse and Malibu, who are also apparently putting a lot of time and effort into making their own lines and recruiting some serious... Uh, talent. I don't. I really don't want to get into Ultraverse right here because there's a much better article a little bit later on. I've had quite a few of you guys ask me about Ultraverse stuff. It's kind of a blank spot for me. I honest, I'm going to be real honest. I just didn't think it was very interesting compared to a lot of the independent stuff and like the. I was reading the Max at the time, so I think my horizons were a little bit away from where. I thought that Ultraverse was at. There is a very wonderful. I mean, okay, just check out this art. This art, man. This I love the fact that at this point, with guys like Sam Keith, Bill Sienkiewicz, all these dudes blowing up, like Marvel is having Sienkiewicz do like some of their big name stuff. I think this is Nick Klein, maybe, uh, or Lynn. No, Lynn Week, maybe. I don't know, but it, this is, uh, it, uh, it's absolutely awesome. I love it. Totally off the wall. Um, this, okay. Yeah, here we go. So this is why we didn't initially talk about Ultraverse. Oh, they do a rundown of reviews in this issue. The first one they talk about is Prime. I've had a couple of people ask me about Prime. Uh, the concept never really appealed to me. Okay because I only knew about it on the very minor bit of a surface face value. However, this hero article right here, and I'm not joking, this like little write-up, which leads into another article later on where they talk about it even more, um, got me interested enough. You will be seeing an Ultraverse uh, piece for me. I will be talking about it. I, I did not realize the inordinate amount of work or some of the people that were involved. I'm not necessarily saying that I will enjoy all of it, uh, but I'm going to say like the fact that Prime in the first issue, now, 
gonna not gonna lie, guys, never read the first issue of Prime. Just didn't care about it, right? So in the first issue of Prime, apparently, like he catches the for anybody who doesn't know, the the um Prime young dorky super skinny kid gets this super flesh goo that covers him and turns him into the world's most powerful superhuman. He's part Superman, part Captain Marvel. Uh, the Captain Marvel angle of him is he does retain the mentality of a 13 year old. Um, so when he finds out that the coach is diddling the little girls, he, he, I think he breaks the coach's arm and f the girls are not like, Oh yeah, thank you for saving. They flip out. They run away. They are horrified of him. They were like, dude, you just almost ripped off that guy's arms. What is wrong with you? You look like Arnold Schwarzenegger in a cartoon. Uh, another thing that I found out that was really cool from this little write-up, anybody know that Brett Blevins did the original design for Prime? Uh, he didn't get credit, but he did. Uh, hard case, they are not so kind. Oh, and they do actually tell you, to, they recommend checking out Prime. X... They're not quite so sold on. Mr. T is a complete miss for them. They say the Neil Adams art is great and everything else about it is absolute garbage, which is, um, I wouldn't even agree that the Neil Adams art for that is good. That is during the steady and quick decline of Neil Adams for me. It was just a, uh, I collect the crap out of it because I love Mr. T. Uh, I wish I could pay him every time I bought one of them, but, uh, it, it is a trash series. <laughs> Hard case, same thing. They, man, they bag on that series. They're really like, there's, it's cool. They got the good, the bad, and the ugly. The, it, they just rampage on Hard Case and Mr. T. X they're not so sure about. It's kind of a preview. They say, Hey, maybe we missed something. It does have Frank Miller cover art. They were like me. The Unbelievable In-Man is cool. They actually, this is, if you have not noticed, during the reign of the Image Ashcan, as they've been mentioned like 40 times in 30 pages so far, they do the review off of the Ashcan edition of the In Unbelievable In-Man, which is done by uh, John Totleben and um, Steve Bissett does the art for it. They are all about the Ashcan edition because you can see the uh, line art from Stephen Bissett, but man, they whew, they go after the uh, after the coloring and the inking and stuff. They just man, they tear that 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 they tear it apart. Uh, I forget who did the uh, inking for it too. I think John Totleben might have inked it. Yeah. Oh God, I'm blind. Yes, John Totleben inked it. They just hammer away on him. They're like it looks like crap. He's not Kirby, and it didn't. The art didn't look like Kirby. Sandman. It's on issue fifty. They're gonna rave about it. They rave about it. Dark Horse Comics. It's a mixed bag. It's a mixed bag as a series. We all know that. Anybody read Dark Horse Comics presents? There was some cool stuff in there, uh, but it was definitely hit or miss. Blood Strike. They are definitely on the Liefeld hating train. They, man, they, they hammer away at Liefeld's art in that, which is interesting because this is 1993, July. Like those guys are reigning king. They're, you're at, uh, you were running the peril of alienating a great deal of your audience by really tearing into Rob Liefeld's art. And then with the good, the bad, and the ugly, literally, they're like, we know nothing about these characters. Nothing about them makes sense. They don't look anatomically correct. You're like, whoa. It's like flash forwarding 30 years and reading a forum post. <clears throat> Not that they have any points. But anyway, we got the Lobo Annual. Um, they, I mean, it's a lackluster issue. It's, it's in the Bloodline series. If you read any of those Bloodlines comics, you know what I'm talking about. I'm not going to waste any more time on that because it's like Lobo, but they do go out of their way to be like, man, Lobo seems super castrated in this. Um, does not seem like a kind of book that Lobo would normally be in. Mostly is in it because it's the Bloodlines book. They review the 1963 uh, issue two, 
which is absolutely incredible. The only thing bad about 1963, obviously, is that 1963 never finished because, well, Image Comics. It was still going strong at the time, and uh, they rant about it. Another cool thing, they actually have a write-up on the new Two-Fisted Tales. Now, like, right before Harvey Kurtzman died, Kitchen Sink and EC joined, and they rebooted a few. I think there was only, like, two or three that ever actually happened. There were supposed to be a few of these old EC titles. And New Two-Fisted Tales was the last one to happen. New Two-Fisted Tales, they, um, one thing that's interesting, New Two-Fisted Tales bombed uh, sales-wise, as far as I know. Um, the sales were always fairly lackluster for any stuff that, in, they, it, and they're new, but I don't think enough people knew who Harvey Kurtzman was that were still out buying like monthly issues off the stands in 1993. I think most of those guys have been run off by Frank Miller writes Spawn, you know, with a Jeff Darrow uh, poster. Now, don't get me wrong. I love Frank Miller and I love Jeff Darrow, but Image Comics was just devouring the newsstands. And so I, I think a lot of guys kind of just left and unfortunately, the new Two-Fisted Tales, that was the last thing that Harvey Kurtzman ever wrote and worked on, man. Uh, it bombed. Interestingly, they give it a rave review. They are like, go out, pick it up, get it, get two copies, one to read, and then once that one falls apart, get another one. And um, the good, the bad, and the ugly, the, the, the bad is that there's only five issues and the ugly is that Harvey Kurtzman had died by the time that this went to print. There were supposed to be five issues, apparently. Only two issues of that series came out. I don't know if that's because Harvey Kurtzman died, but I, which is what I'd always thought. Because Harvey Kurtzman died, uh, like one issue in or right before the publication of issue one, so there was no more Kurtzman stuff to carry on the series being un supposedly being a reboot, you know, with original EC guys and blah, 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 blah. Well, it turns out, I think the sales were just bad enough. I want to know what happened to the other three issues. If there are three more issues of the new Two-Fisted Tales, what it's, who, where, where is that? I want to see it, please, for the love of God. Um, Pitt. They say as a mixed bag, art's great, story is kind of maybe cool, maybe dumb, not enough there to really tell. If you've ever read Pit One, that's a fairly accurate assessment of Pit One. Now, the geek, man, I could not believe that they had the geek on here. Mike Allred shows up throughout this issue. It's super cool. Whoever wrote this definitely was into, and I don't mean just like one guy, I mean like everybody who worked on this, I think actually liked comic books and liked reading them because they were super into Mike Allred. Mike Allred was not big at this time. If you've watched my uh, Mike Allred piece about getting rejected off Sandman, you'll know that his big comeback, his big break out of DC was on Vertigo titles, The Geek, and then Prez, and this is the first, this is the geek. Um, they're very honest about it. They say that Mike Allred's a great writer, the art is wonderful, but that it's kind of just the geek. And um, there's not a super lot you can do with the geek because it was like the first ever hippie comic, I guess, but. Nobody who wrote it understood hippies, and it's just a terrible series. So, up and coming. This is pretty cool. This is a little, like, hey, okay, this is the series that are either out right now or getting ready to come out that you should be checking out. Normally with Wizards, you're like, looking at, hey, Jay Lee is doing this month's... Co Even when I did uh, the in Comics Inside or Inside Comics, man, I am dyslexic. 
ooh, that is bad. I can't even remember the order of it. Um, but when I did that uh, magazine, when you looked into it, really, they were recommending, I think they were pushing a Namor cover over more traditional spec, like image spec at the time, because less people were buying Namor and it was a Jay Lee cover. This, they pushed some quality comic books. I couldn't believe it. Batman Grindel, obviously, they're a little bit invested in that. They got an ash can. Maybe they got a deal with uh, Matt Wagner. I'm not sure exactly what the deal is there, but obviously there's something going on. Um, they go on to talk about uh, the adventures of Madman, though. I absolutely adore Madman. Uh, he is one of the most underrated, and I think 30 years from now, when people are looking back and reading comic books, this is going to be one of those series where people are going to wonder why no one was talking about this. Really nice to see Mike Allred repeatedly show up in this issue and Madman specifically getting very specific and intelligent compliments. They talk about how the writing is quirky, but it's very lovable. How it's almost golden age in its tone and yet extremely existential. They get the book. It's very cool. They talk about an unnamed Elseworlds book right up here by Jerry Ordway. And I said Jerry Ordway by uh, James Robinson and Paul Smith. They also are very complimentary of that series, though they do kind of just lump it in. I know a lot of people see it as like a Watchmen derivative book. Golden Age is not just that. It is a very cool series. You can pick it up for nothing. I mean, that is one of the few series that's like prestige square format. I You can find that in dollar bins all day. Pick it up, man. James Robinson was firing on all cylinders at, that, uh, at this point. Paul Smith really, I think, just did some great stuff. They talk about um, Clive Barker... Um, the cool thing is they're not just talking about his Hellraiser books and, um, oh wow, what was Clive Barker's imprint? He had an imprint with uh, Marvel at one point. Shadowline, maybe? It was terrible. Just, no, it wasn't all terrible. I shouldn't say that. It was a very mixed bag and there was not a lot of uh, editorial restraint shown, shall I say that cool stuff that snuck through but a lot of it was crap so um it's pretty cool to see them talking up uh ecto kid ecto kid's got a bunch of spec going on right now or it did a couple weeks ago i don't know the market is so finicky right now but ecto kid no it's not a great book i'm not gonna be one of those guys and be oh yeah it's one of those undiscovered gems that you should definitely do but if you pick it up for cheap, man, like, because everything I think except for issue one, you can probably, they'll pay you to take out of the bins at the local comic shop at this point. Ecto Kid was pretty interesting. Um, they uh, talk about, uh, we talked about Madman. They do Madman, they do Madman. They do uh, Mr. Monster versus the Nazis from Mars. I like that they're talking about guys like that. Uh, they talk about Flaming Carrot and Bob Burden. Um, they are talking about him in reference to negative burn, man. I'm going to do a video on negative burn for anybody who didn't read that series. I cannot recommend picking up the original. I think it was like 50 issues. It ran negative burn was just the most. I, Caliber Press, I think, originally put it out, and then Dynamite got it, and uh, I think it was Dynamite. Dynamite and someone else got it eventually. The Dynamite and uh, subsequent, the second volume and the third volume, they're okay. The first volume, especially the Caliber Press stuff, there is some cool stuff in Negative Burn. I was really impressed they called Negative Burn out. One of the things that was interesting, these are the kind of comics that I was seeing. They do have a few more complimentary things to say about some of the bigger stuff than uh, Comics Inside or Inside Comics. But that Negative Burn is the kind of stuff that they were bringing up 
it was really cool to uh to have a con to have a magazine this lasted quite a while it didn't last like wizard long but it lasted a while that is awesome i'm gonna have to pick up subsequent issues of this to see how much of this they followed through on i want to see how much they kept up with these competitions uh these contests because just wait and then um i really want to see if they kept up with coverage like this because they have a lot of very complimentary things to say about bob burden bob burden is like a huge hero to me i thought maybe he was just coming up a few times because of the ash can article that and we'll get into the reason why i'm even saying that a little bit later on but i think genuinely they got flaming carrot and um greed because they talk about uh, evan dorkin a few times uh, milk and cheese originally appeared in uh, greed i think he wrote that magazine maybe they just appeared in it evan dorkin's milk and cheese they got they get evan dorkin that's cool man not everybody was digging evan dorkin in 1993 i'm gonna say that they uh I mean, they rain fire on X-Men 304. They say that it looks just rushed and um, they're interested in the return of Magneto, but that's about it. Um, they talk up American Splendor. That's super cool. Do not see this kind of stuff all the time in these magazines. The, American Splendor is one of those series, I think, historically... People are finally starting to catch on to Harvey Picar, but um, at the time he, he did not get the press that he deserved. That's that's for sure. Um, Tales from the Yond is part of 1963. They rave on that as well. Uh, it really is. If 1963 had finished, that would have been one of the greatest series ever. I would recommend that you guys all go out and read it. As it is, they didn't finish the series, so it's really freaking annoying. And I don't really know what to tell you because it's really fun to read some of it, but it just never go. It fails to go anywhere because it doesn't finish. Whatever happened to Wetworks? This is interesting. Walls Portasio. Um, for anybody who thinks of Walls Portasio as one of the founding members of Image, and he was, he joined. Uh, subsequently, Jim Lee talked Walls Portasio into joining. He was, in my opinion, his own second wave, though. He joined after, I believe his, I know he had family deaths. I think originally he was out of the country because his parents had died and wet works has been delayed at this point because his sister has died. Now they don't say that in the article. They uh, just bring up family problems, but that is what's going on in 1993 with Wallace Portacio. That guy, man, he just never caught a break. Hero Insider, I do not know who Mysterious Fanboy is, and uh, I don't have money, but I do have a very particular set of skills. I will find you, and I will hurt you. This is one of the most annoying things I've ever read, you just rumor-mongering. Like, he uses, like, little M, nope, the man in black wouldn't be, he doesn't even use names because he's such a wimp. I can't, I'm not even going to, you know what? Not even going to deal with it. We're not going to talk about it. It's crap. It's absolute crap. It's trash. And honestly, it made me angry to read. Spawn Pogs made me less angry to see. I got reticent and wanted to pull out Pogs. No, I didn't. I really didn't want to pull out Pogs. I did, however, want to get on eBay and see if I could find any of the Platinum Poggies um, which were solid nickel metal pogs. I did not, but alas, if I can find any pictures, maybe I will stick links to them <laughs> in the description. McFarlane interview. This is interesting. So as you might've noticed, Hero Illustrated is not necessarily writing the big trend of everything that image does is gold. Now it sells like gold. Uh, and they're the first people to tell you that, but they are also the first people to point out that there is beginning to be slipping interest in Image because of their problems with getting books out on time. They obviously have spoken to Jim Lee by this point, is my estimation. 
Now, if you look up the Hero Illustrated video special, which came out, I don't know, for some later issue, he talks, it's very cool. There's not much Jim Lee stuff on there, but what is on there is very cool because he's almost never candid like this. He talks about a little bit about what's going on with things. And one of the things that he talks about is really wanting to get the company back online, how they put so much time and energy and effort into getting books back on a schedule. And Hero, I think, has spoken to them enough to enough of the image founders on a consistent basis that they're pretty sure that that's going to be happening. And inevitably, that did happen for most of their books, at least for most of their creators. Rob Liefeld looking in your direction. Um, oh my God, there's some big hypes for uh, for for Death Mate later on in this, and it just made me. And Bob Layton is even interviewed in this. Not in relate, not it's like before Deathmate ever started. And poor Bob Layton is all happy and yay, we're gonna do this crossover, which was never the case for him. But man, knowing what happened with Deathmate is just that video is coming soon. This definitely made me. It was like, yep, I'm, I'm, I gotta do that. So the the non pro image angle that they take with some of their stuff that they were, it's not non, it's not negative. It's realistic. It's honest. It's art over story. It's honest critiques of the material. They throw at Todd McFarlane. That's kind of ballsy. I think that's probably why this is a three page interview as opposed to the normal, like five, eight, 10 page article, uh, you know, five, eight, 10 page interviews that McFarlane was usually giving at this point. Um, but it is cool to see him answer them. And it does seem like Todd McFarlane gets taken off guard a little bit and enough so that he honestly answers some pretty interesting questions. They ask him about selling out. He responds that really like, it's not about selling out. He was the best paid guy at Marvel I don't know. McFarlane's really stroking his ego in some points of this. I'm not a, I can't say I'm, I'm an inordinate fan of Todd McFarlane. I, I did love his work growing up, but really, I mean, he just, he walked away from his own series. He's like getting all these acclaims for running spawn forever. Like, where is all the love for Eric Larson? That dude's been writing and drawing Savage Dragon the whole time. McFarlane was off crashing businesses the dude bankrupted himself oh anyway so they kind of bag on mcfarlane a little bit i think some of it is almost needless honestly they're picking at him at the whole style over substance thing and he's like dude i'm not claiming to be the mat i'm not claiming to be a master writer and he never did I'll give that to Todd McFarlane. He was honest about it. He knew he wasn't a great writer, but he was like, look, people like seeing my drawings. They want to buy my comics. I figured I only had to sell 30,000 comics to make what I was making doing, uh, I think like, a, you know, half a million or whatever it was for Marvel. Why not? I can get behind that. Um, McFarlane kind of gets a little bit short with them at one point. They ask him about like selling out. And McFarlane is like, he goes into this thing about, we didn't sell out. Basically, we wanted to make the money off of our characters as the best paid guy at Marvel. Why would I leave? If I was just selling out, I would have stayed with Marvel, blah, 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 blah. And he's like, I wanted to go to my own company where, uh, you know, I make the money and I can pay the people what I want. But he had such draconian labor. I This is right around... When they hired, I don't think Neil Gaiman's name is in the list. They bring up a bunch of guys they've hired, like Alan Moore and stuff. And like, for anybody who doesn't know, good God, Todd McFarlane dicked Neil Gaiman, man. That he stole a character, two characters, Angela and uh, Cogliostro, that Gaiman wrote, and then refused to pay Neil Gaiman even though like the whole deal was an image, you know, you write it, you come up with it, you make the money. He refused to pay for it. He's like, nope, no, we're not doing that. Not doing that. It was nasty. Went to court. He lost. 
eventually uh he had to give up the rights to miracle man aka marvel man um and as a result and uh this is right around the time like he used tony twist's name in a comic which is a professional hockey player by the way and uh got the pants suit off of him not long afterwards that lawsuit was a bit frivolous a bit crap to me but um it's interesting to hear him talk about why he left Marvel and his relationship with Marvel and how Image is going to be different. And uh, it did not quite play out that way, Mr. McFarlane. You did not play nicely. But they ask him directly in reference to like Alan Moore and a couple of the other like uh, prestigious guys that they're hiring, which will include Neil Gaiman. It, you know, why are you doing that? Like... If you guys can sell books and it's all about art, and he's like, look, they're better writers. I wish I could say that they sell, you know, sold a ton more books, but really the Cerebus issue of Spawn and stuff, he's like, we do those because they're better writers than us, and we know that, and it's our comic company, and we want to do that. I can respect that. Um, Brave New Worlds. This was cool. Not going to lie. I've had a bunch of you guys ask me about uh, Ultraverse specifically. I always thought of Malibu as a joke. I'm not going to front or lie about that. It was in my younger mind, like one of those lower tier Valiant books um, or lower tier Valiant uh, ripoffs. That's what a lot of their stuff looked like. I was never a huge fan of the Prime design, which was like their big seller. In reading this article, they really do a wonderful job of selling you on giving the Ultraverse universe a shot. It is cool. They talk a little bit about, I'm not going to talk about each and every series that they go into, but they do go into every single one of the Ultraverse's launching books, and they even talk about some of their upcoming books. Um, some of the, just the little tiny blurbs were enough to be like, well, that actually sounds like a fairly cool premise. If any of that, you know, pans out, I would be down, uh, they talk about how um, one of the things that is going to put Ultraverse ahead of the pack is that they have essentially a Bible where everything happens and it, it's all planned out. So like it, if Prime gets punched in the face and his jaw gets broken in uh, hard case number three, then that month's prime, his jaw is going to be broken. That sounds silly, but go read comics with guys like Spider-Man and Wolverine. And you tell me if there is any sort of attempt at continuity across books that appear monthly. And in the 90s, especially with Marvel, that got rampantly bad. Uh, they also talk about how because of Image Comics and how Image is doing creator-owned properties and trying to reimburse their creators better, they're also going to be following suit. I don't know how any of that worked out for them. I do know that the Ultraverse did not last, uh, I think, by 1990. This was night like the beginning of 93, and then by 1994, Marvel had already acquired it they started doing some team-ups not long after that with Marvel books that are some are considered to be part of like volume two of some of that Ultraverse stuff. And then something happened, which no one will talk about with the Ultraverse properties, that none of the titles can be revived. Marvel owns Ultraverse still. Joe Cusada, I found a couple of uh, quotes where Joe Cusada does he's like yeah no we definitely still own ultraverse and we definitely can't publish the books there are some people who say that's because they have to pay like five percent 
um, of all of the prophets to each of the creators of the guys from the original books, living or dead. I don't buy that. I think there might be something hinky dinky to do with the rights that got really messed up with stuff like Valiant did. Um, Valiant had enough people that were really ardently dedicated to getting that stuff back out. And after years of legal battling and trying to figure stuff out, you know, it's finally back out most of it. Um, and enough to the point where they could license, you know, Bloodshot and several other things for movies. But that's taken, I mean, the better part of like a decade and a half. It's just absolutely nuts. So second part of this is Comics Greatest World. Comics Greatest World, I knew absolutely freaking nothing about. It is the Dark Horse launch that had uh, X, Ghost. There was another one that I read, uh, Monster, I think, which is him. Is it was, it was uh, there was another one that I used to. Anyway, you guys have probably never heard of any of them except for Ghost. Apparently, there's like. When Dark Horse launched, they were going to do a series. It was going to be every four weeks you got, or every week you got four comics. And there were going to be 16 $1 comics that had stories from these individual titles and then one overarching story that tied each of the that week's series into a quote-unquote world inside of Dark Horse's Comics Greatest World. They do a really cool job. They go, uh, they break down like the four worlds, which are Arcadia. Oh no, 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 no. Those aren't the worlds. Are they? Yeah. Arcadia. There's Golden City. Vortex. One other one. Oh, Catalyst, I think. It's pretty cool. They introduce each world and then they tell you the titles that are going to be appearing in that world. They do a pretty cool job. They got Arcadia, Golden City, uh, um, Steel Harbor. That's what it is. And then the the Vortex write up section is really sh it's it's kind of stunted. I don't know. I don't know if they ran out of space um, because they needed to cover the groundbreaking glory of Deathmate, which was going to be the greatest thing since sliced bread. Nay, breath itself. Um, yeah, it did not turn out like that. One of the really sad things is, in this article, as I said, they talked to Jim Lee several times, and Jim Lee was making it really clear. They were imposing, like, fines for artists who solicited books and then turned them in late. Actual fine. Like, you paid, man, and not a little bit of money. It was enough to make these dudes really think twice about it. And they're like, the best thing about Deathmate is that it's it's going to be out on time because everybody's really busting their humps. And it, thanks. Thanks again, Rob Liefeld. Full page layouts. I mean, Malibu, like Ultraverse is super pushing it. So, Ashcan Comics. I was so excited to read this. And then, like, just kind of so bummed out. Cause it's like three pages. They go in, they do a pretty cool job. This is basically what you would read on Wikipedia before Wikipedia, which is interesting because Wikipedia didn't exist and not everybody knew about comics. Um, or I suppose not everybody knew about Ashcan comics, I should say. So they start off, um, they talk about the Golden Age, Ashcan comics, which are really just, if you don't know about Ashcan, Golden Age Ashcan books, they're not like what we think of as Ashcan books. Basically, they were done to secure copyrights to titles. Um, you would take like a pre-existing cover and a pre-existing interior most of the time, put a new logo on it, and then send it to like the pat. I think it was the patent office. And that way, nobody else, you, you had proof that you'd come up with the name first, you owned it. Uh, there's stuff like there's super woman, there's super girl, there's super boy. This is decades before the comics ever existed. Um, oh yeah, there's super woman. Wow, I'm very observant. I read this many times in preparation for this video. But it's cool, they, they get into that a little bit. Uh, another super famous one is Superman Comics. I think there's three of those. Is widely considered to be one of the most 
expensive comics uh, in existence. And actually, one's going on sale right around uh, the time, or probably has already gone on sale by the time this issue came out. And uh, the guy who's writing this is lamenting the fact that he cannot afford it. And uh, it's pretty cool. They go directly into the Renaissance, which was... It's cool because if you'd have read, if you would have written this article six months before, it really would have ended after the Golden Age. You could have talked about Bob Burden, and they do. They talk about um, Bob Burden's uh, flaming carrot and how he repopularized them as a way to uh, s- sell a collector's item, something unique to uh, people who are into his book. And that was in the 80s, and it kind of reignited. They were black and white. The pens, they, uh, the books were black and white anyway. But uh, even after Flaming Carrot went color, he would do ash can editions, and those remained black and white, which is uh, why the image comics are all black and white. Uh, so they do say that some of the companies are experimenting with color. This right here, I think, is an image of the uh, Madman Hero Illustrated ash can that came with, uh, with issue two. Hopefully, I will be buying that and we can look. But they say that some of them are starting to play with color. They talk about some of them. There's a funny, just hilarious breakdown of uh, ash cans on the side here. Like, uh, like Cyber Force is like the most expensive one on there, I think. Which is so you can't give most of oh no I, I'm sorry. The the alternate cover Shadow Hawk is also a $25 book. Ooh, and Supreme is 30 bucks for the for the, the color cover. Mmm. Wow. I'm sure all those held up. Interestingly enough, uh when I was looking at this, I was like, okay, well there's darker image for ten dollars. Woo! But uh, the Max is not on here. Basically, almost all the other image books. Max had more ash cans than I think basically any of the other image comics that I know about. Not to mention, they do not like Max. They do, however, bring up some interesting ones. Um, Yeah, there's the Flaming Carrot and there's the Action Comics number one. This one's pretty cool. They bring up a uh, 24-hour comic that was done by Neil Gaiman that apparently got put out. Uh, the being a account of the life and death of the Emperor Helio Gabalus. Oh, yeah, I'm probably going to have to cut that out because otherwise I will sound like an inbred redneck trying to read that out. Um, it was pretty cool. I didn't know that existed. I kind of want to read it. I'm not a big fan of his art. But uh, Neil Gaiman around this time really was firing on all cylinders. They uh, they do a pretty good job. It's like three pages, but uh, they do a good job of like talking about how images repopularized it, and uh, the reason that image repopularized it is because of flaming carrot. Pretty freaking awesome, yeah. So uh, is the pen worth more than the comic? Interesting article actually to me. This is about um, autographs. So this is 90s. This is when autographs are kicking off. There is this huge argument going on at the time between a lot of people. Are autographs, do they uh, increase the value of the book? Are they defacing the book? Um, How do you know if it's an actual autograph? You know, if you didn't get it done, who's to say someone didn't uh, fudge that little signature there? It's interesting to see their take on things. Um, Some of the stuff they say is absolute idiocy. Like there's a uh, inscribed bone to John and they're like, getting something inscribed to yourself is probably not a wonderful investment except for anybody else named John. Really? That's been the deal with signatures for everything, for all collectibles. They do, however, make the equation of like, don't get people to sign books that they didn't work on. That seems like common sense, but I see that all the time still today. I don't understand why people like Todd McFarlane have to be like, I don't want to sign books I didn't work on. I know it's a Spider-Man book and I'm famous for Spider-Man, but I really not don't want to sign a book I had nothing to do with. Makes sense to me. Um, 
They say to be careful about investing in money. Really, you need to think about the scarcity of the signature. Duh. Think about the scarcity of the book. Duh. Think about the scarcity of the book and the signature together. Duh. And they also point out the one really great thing about this article. Don't overpay for it. Just because a book is like signed by somebody doesn't mean you should pay $300 for a $30 Shadowhawk Ashcan comics. The one thing I'm going to point out about this article does strike me a tad strange. Many of their contests, which we will be getting into soon, I swear to God, because there's a ton more of them. Uh, they hype signatures. They are all about the signatures. Ooh, Death Watch 2000. I mean, everybody remembers that from Continuity Comics, right? Because Neil Adams was just great right then. Oh, man. Just, oh, Jesus. So, Bob Layton interview. He's talking about uh, Dr. Mirage. If you don't know what Dr. Mirage is, it was really weird. If you're like, why is this superhero wearing a ski suit? He's wearing an actual ski suit. That's not like actually haha -ha funny. He's actually wearing a ski suit. He dies in a ski suit. So when he returns, it's like a ghostly apparition. He's in a ski suit. Now, now it all be like a super stylish, like future ski, or a ski suit, but it's definitely a ski suit nonetheless. Like those boots are just like, wow. Okay, guys. But uh, Dr. Mirage like dies and um, in the Valiant universe, dead was dead. That was like their big selling point. Dr. Mirage was going to be the one guy to kind of break that, to show like maybe you didn't always die. But the thing is, he's basically like dead man. He's ba he can't interact with things corporeally, but his wife is still alive. The one interesting angle about Dr. Mirage is it's a kind of a romance comic between uh, this dead guy and his wife who's still alive. And there are all these bad guys coming to kill his wife. And he can't really affect the world anymore. He has to deal with like her and all the surroundings. But Bob Layton, they, uh, when they're talking to him, they... Uh, <laughs> They bring up Deathmate and they're like, so what do you think? He's like, oh, it's going to be great. Everything's going to be out on time. It's going to be wonderful. And or, uh, I'm definitely not going to have to get into a plane and fry to rob Liefeld's house to get the art. I think like a year after the issue is supposed to be out. So spotlight on Savage Dragon and Eric Larson. This was a pretty cool article, man. It's not groundbreaking, but it was cool to read an article that talked about Eric Larson. He does not get like he did. He, get, he got a lot of press coverage. Not going to lie. Like, I mean, he was around a lot because he was one of the image dudes, but he did not get the love that a lot of the image guys um, got. And he didn't get the respect him and Valentino, man, if I had a dollar for every time, I felt like they were kind of getting made fun of in interviews. or They were definitely consolation interviews. You can't get McFarlane, can't get, can't get Rob Liefeld. You can get Jim Valentino and, and Eric Larson. They're always willing to talk. One of the cool things is this is still right on that precipice, right after he's left Marvel, right before everything just got vitriolic. Um, on at least on Marvel's side. I never saw that from Eric Larson. I had some people say that apparently uh, Eric got very, very voicey and uh, had kind of an attitude at some conventions with him. Uh, from my understanding, like him and Rob Liefeld really don't like each other. I think a lot of that was him having to be around Liefeld because one of the comments was actually they'd gotten into a screaming match in front of a group of people, like uh, just in the artist alley of a convention, which is crazy. That did not sound like Eric Larson to me. He's very level-headed. He just left Marvel. He's talking about, like, I left them. Uh, you know, we knew Amazing Spider-Man was going to last forever. It just really wasn't panning out anymore. And me leaving was very um, 
there's no there was no acrimonious feelings towards him leaving Marvel. He left Marvel on good terms. Marvel left him on good terms. That would not stay that way for long. So Eric Larson, shucks, what else is there? Savage Dragon. I don't know. Turtles are going to show up in Savage Dragon. Savage Dragon's going to show up in Turtles. He's talking about that shared universe. If you watch the Inside Comics issue deep dive that I did, um, he talks about it's it's a few months before this. He talks about like the excitement of having a shared image universe. That never really panned, man. Um, him and Valentino were both really stoked on that, and it just never happened for them the way that they thought it would. But for Larson at this point, it's cool because he has found his workaround on that. Because the image doesn't want to do it. He's like, no, nah, dude, I got buddies out at uh, Mirage, so I'm going to do some stuff with uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. He's talking about uh, bringing um, his old boss from Megaton Comics, where he did his first ever professional work, and bringing the character Vanguard back from that series uh, as backups in Savage Dragon. It's really cool. I love, I love to read Eric Larson. He's just a cool guy. There's some interesting tidbits. He does also confirm. It's nice to see like actual quotes from him confirming a few things that I had. Uh, I don't, I don't, I'd never made like assumptions, but more suppositions about, he does say that like, he didn't have control over his characters. He wanted more control over his characters. Not necessarily that he wanted more money, but that was one of the major reasons he left Marvel. So that's cool to read, you know, a direct quote. It's short, but it is pretty nice. It's a decent little, for three pages is great, John. Mm -hmm. This though, now we're going to start getting into like, well, I mean, this is absolute crap. Anyway, we'll talk about that in a second. This is crazy. Uh, today, everybody remembers this this cover, right? The original art for this got given away by Hero Illustrated, man. I tried. I looked and looked and looked online for any information about, like, has this ever gone back up for resale? Who won it? Anything. I, I don't know. I'm going to have to pick up um maybe and does anybody have like scans of this if you have scans of this flip through there and see if you do they have do they list the winners i assume they would list the winners because you you know basically want to do that but i want to know what happened to this cover that is a super iconic cover at this point i mean it really is dude like that scotty young cover where he pokes fun at it jesus it's like a 40 dollars, 50 dollars comic at this point i okay i'll tell you what this is but we're not going to talk about it it's an interview with the x-men now, the reason we're not going to talk about it is like summed up in this like gigantic, I look good in my costume, but pe oh, I'm sorry. I look good in my costume, but people don't realize it's very uncomfortable and it creeps up my... Summing up everything that disgusted me about the 90s comic scene. Yeah, that's right, guys. I said it. Sorry. I'm a white dude. I, I definitely like women, um, but uh, that's not the only reason I read comic books. And let me tell you, reading something that derogatory, like that is the summation of what they have to say about Psylocke. She's outside working on her tan and then wanders inside in a uh, even more revealing uh, swimsuit. I was like, this is just stupid. Just stupid. They, it's stupid. We're not going to talk about it anymore. It upset me. We're, it, <laughs> I'm old and it upset me. And we're not going to talk about it. Uh, this made me laugh. I would have thought Marvel would have copyrighted Snicked. I didn't know that wasn't copyrighted. Clever play, Chris Claremont. Not working for Marvel at this point. Ah, yes. This is pretty cool. Oh, no, this is complete crap. I forgot. Yeah. Yeah, no, this, this article is... I, this article is crap. I, um... Mark Nelson. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, but, uh... I don't want art lessons, especially not somebody who's trying to teach me to like paint inside of a magazine. Come on, dude. Cool thing is you can actually do competitions. At the end of each month, they're going to have like drawing, or they say they will, I don't know, um, that there's going to be like drawing competitions. And this one is to fill in the character on this. I've always been a big fan of like interactive art and art prompts. That's one thing that I really liked about Bart Kira. So this is pretty cool. 
Yeah, this is another one. So we've got a giveaway. I forget what you can get from here. I don't even remember. Oh, win an original piece of comic book art. Is that how you win? Oh, is that what you have to do to win the... Uh, no, it's not. No, because that was pages before. Yeah, should have been what you had to do to win that. Uh, I think all you had to do was like write your address down and mail it in. Anyway, so yeah, you can get uh, original art if you win that competition. That was pretty cool. Then on this page, they've got uh, like Ultraverse, Hero, Special Limited Editions, which Wizard never got super into. They do exist. And if anybody, please, for the love of all that's holy, oh my God, if anybody has a gold or platinum max one half, please, Jesus, get, in the con get a hold of me. I, I used to have one of each and they have been stolen from me years ago when my collection got pillaged and it's proven to be like the one thing I, I don't even see them anymore. Um, but hero are the guys who really went to town on that. Now with some of the more popular stuff, I think really only gold stuff exists for most of the wizard stuff. I honestly don't know how you even originally got the gold or the platinum versions of their stuff. I don't know if it was retailer appreciation stuff like the, uh, I know the max one half, uh, was retailer appreciation. So maybe they were, but with these, essentially the only way that you could get any of the hero exclusive versions of any of these comics, and they did a ton of these was from Hero. Uh, you, you, it, it was uh, from these competitions in Hero. It was pretty cool. This was another one that like totally caught me off guard. I could not believe it. I was like, there is a Rebel Studios ad full on with like Tim Vigil Faust chilling out right in the middle of your magazine. That's pretty cool. That's a bold move to have next to Superman. Kudos, guys. I mean, hey, dude, I love Faust. It's cool to see, like, like Ed Piscor and Jim Rugg, like, apparently are fans, too. And uh, I've seen a lot more love for that series now that they brought it up. Um, they have this, uh, yeah, if this competition is make your own hero cover, which is, you know, directly ripped. I don't even know. Maybe Wizard ripped that off from them. I don't know if Wizard actually had art at, uh, art competitions for covers this early on. I think they might've just done the uh, envelope art like they had, cause they have the envelope art, which is obvious. I guess that was just a thing that happened or whatever, but they ripped off the envelope art, but I think maybe this was theirs. You won that? Silver Surfer number one. Dude, there's some crazy giveaways. Like that's, I mean, yeah, obviously it's not Spider-Man number one or Amazing Fantasy 15 or anything, but like, heck yeah. Or uh, Incredible Hulk number one crazy weird ads in here for some off the wall stuff. I do not have any clue what uh triumphant comics is. I suppose it's the collector's universe. Uh, Ooh, Skybox, Ultraverse comic cards. We had, uh, we have one of those, right? Yeah. Okay. There we go. Yep. Boneyard. Boneyard is part of the Skybox Ultraverse comic cards. All right. That's what they would have looked like. They all had these disgusting neon pointers. They're like the most gauche looking card set ever. Oh, well, these don't have the regular backs. The backs were even more garish than the fronts on these. Uh, my cousin gave me a set of these before he died. And uh, I hold on to them because uh, Trav gave them to me. But man, they are just absolutely terrible. Actually, that was the extent, literally the extent of my entire interaction with Ultraverse. And now that I think about it, and look at this stupid, stupid, stupid car. And I'm so sorry to anybody who likes these because you thought they were cool when you were a kid and still do, because I get that. But like uh, this stupid, stupid card might be the reason that I actually never gave the Ultraverse a shot. Not that card in particular, but this series. Like, I think it looked so dumb that I just was like, nope, not, not doing that. Not doing that. Okay. Um, I could get really in depth here, but I really don't want to. The Razor's Edge 
So this is all news coming up about stuff that's somewhat related to comics and some that's not. Uh, Spider-Man, James Cameron's going to be making Spider-Man. So everybody who's like a thousand years old like I am, this is not news. That was in like every mag and every like trade rag everywhere. James Cameron was on Spider-Man, like white on rice. It was just, it was going to happen. It was that inevitability, you know? And then years later, basically, uh, nothing. Cause that movie, I don't even know. I, they never, they never did anything with Spider-Man. It's, it is one of the most talked about co movies that I have ever, ever heard of that didn't get made i read more articles about that freaking movie man and what's crazy is uh i've got a buddy who collects um un, un uh unproduced scripts and he sent me a uh, just an an awesome collection of uh unproduced and uh, early drafts of scripts so hopefully i'll be having time to go through and read some of those and uh, I can share some of like the insane stuff. I cannot wait to just ream that Sam Ham Watchmen freaking write up. Holy crap. Talk about some of the worst writing ever. I never believed Sam Ham when he said like, I wasn't the guy who let Vicky Vale into the into the Bat Cave. They wanted me to do that. And Warner Brothers, man, whatever. I never believed him. After reading the scene where Watchmen are the Watchmen, like everybody who's, I, I'm pretty sure they're all still alive, gets transported into our universe where like somebody is reading a Watchmen comic, like the kid is reading the Black Freighter. That's how the movie ends. Yeah, I was at that point, I was like, yeah, you know what? You are full of crap. It's going to be a new Superman movie. Uh, that did not happen. We all know that. Um... I do believe the production that they're referring to is 93, but uh, the production ran on on that for a, just forever. Chris Reeves and Margot Kidder were out and they were struggling to recast. That was, I believe, right around the time when they started uh, looking in the direction that would become the Nick Cage Superman. Uh, so, oh my God. Good God, yes. So, this one is absolutely berserker. I didn't know this. Anybody know that Arnold Schwarzenegger literally signed a contract to play freaking Sergeant Rock? There are all these, like, it's crazy reading how many deals were going on around this time. Because about 20 years later, we would start seeing these movies, but none of the movies that got signed. Like, essentially, none of them that were in the works back then ever made it through. I am morbidly curious to know what a, like, 1994, 95, Paul Verhoeven-directed Sergeant Rock would have been like, oh my God, can you imagine that? Oh, Jesus. So, oh, oh, yes, and this one was absolutely... Uh, heartbreaking. I never even knew there was a deal for a Plastic Man movie and like a big Plastic Man movie. It's supposed to be like a big special effects deal. Let me see. Um, there's a new Rambo coming out. Die Hard got ripped off. Godzilla is getting ready. The the uh, 98 Godzilla is like... They, actually, funny if anybody uh, remembers like uh, Godzilla 1998. Uh, first of all, I'm sorry. My prayers are with you. But um, yeah, I saw it in the theater too, so don't worry. I can't I can't help it. Anything with Jean Reno, I have to see. So Godzilla, like they, they're promising right here it is going to be Americanized. They're going to Americanize the crap out of it. And it's just going to be Godzilla breaking stuff and being... Godzilla. And, uh, that was, that was what, uh, no, none of that was in, um, the 1998 Godzilla, except for the Americanization. It was dumb, very dumbed down. I'll give them that. Demolition Man, uh, Wayne's World 2. They do an announcement about like Karate Kid 4. It's like, what the hell does Karate Kid 4 
where the Naked Gun 3 have to do with comic books. Okay. I think somebody needed to fill some space. But that's when I got really teed off, man. So throughout this entire magazine, like they literally rampage on uh, on the Max several times. They're like trying to find where they have the write-up on the first issue. But they 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 man, they lay into the Max. They're like, this doesn't make sense. They obviously are not that into the art. I was kind of upset. And then the biggest piece of information they have about Max is Mad Max versus Mad Max and about how they have more in common. One of the things that this book had going for it, in my opinion, while I was reading it uh, 30 years after its publication, was that it didn't do the like lowest common denominator God, what were those? The casting calls where it's like, oh yeah, let's cast our own movie because we're definitely, people are going to listen to us because we're cool. That stuff was always just a waste of time in Wizard to me. I never really enjoyed that stuff. That's a waste of time. And it was insulting to me. I like the character and they kind of poke fun at Max and I don't like that. Yeah, I guess maybe I'm too temperamental about that. But whatever, I, it just... Kind of senseless, man. Of all the books, they give a freaking shot. Maybe that's it. Because of all the books that they really give a shot, and they're like, Ultraverse, totally, you know, we'll give it a shot. And Dark Horse, hey, at least X, you know, is we got Frank Miller covers. And they're I, they're looking on the upside, and they're like, hey, you know, uh, the Max doesn't make any sense. We're not really, uh, not really digging that crap. Oh, piss on you, man. This was the big one. Uh, the Amazing Sp Spider-Man number one or any of 150 other fantastic prizes. This was sealed brand new when I got it. So at the end, we will get out something and we'll scratch this off. And uh, let us pray to God that it does not have three spiders on it. Because if this has three spiders on it, I, uh, you'll probably hear me cry like a small child. Um, I would kill for a Spider-Man number one. Yes, I did say kill, so don't come to my house if you have one. <laughs> no, um, Death Watch 2000. Ooh, yeah, everybody remembers that, right? 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 Continuity Comics, man. Oh, it's the, it's the card series. It's even better. That's so great. So, Death Watch was like... I think basically what it was was, an, was essentially a excuse to have Neil Adams draw dragons and crap. It was merchandised into a whole bunch of other stuff that I somehow ended up owning over the years, though I never purchased a single piece of it. It's kind of like um, one of those albums, you know, like the Crow soundtrack. No, you guys probably don't know because I'm ancient. You guys don't even listen to CDs anymore. Back in my day, we had these things called CDs. <laughs> Back in my day, we had these things called CDs and like, I swear to God, I never got one. I mean, I love it. I never got one, but I think I had like 15 copies, no exaggeration, like 15 copies of the Crow soundtrack. Death Watch 2000 was that freaking comic and card series. I never bought a one, but I swear to God, I've probably owned a long box and at least three or four sets of these cards. Um, oh, and the other big announcement on here is uh, Neil Adams is also going to be doing a series of sport cards because... We need to milk Neil Adams for more crap. Because who doesn't want to see him draw Shaquille O'Neal, Ken Griffey Jr., or Manon... I don't even know who the hell that is. Manon Ream? You know what? That is why I read comics and not, uh, not, not sports. So, okay. okay. Sorry. Sorry. Normally, I'm just going to flip through all this crap. But, like... This was dope. Not gonna lie, I was flipped out. So the five most underrated movies of all time, The Hidden. Okay, Hidden's not a bad movie. I don't think it's one of the most underrated films of all time. Um, Evil Dead 2, yeah, that definitely, especially at this time, you gotta understand in like 1993, this was like still VHS times, man. Like there were some of us that were seeking out the like, uh, supposedly uncut version of Evil Dead 2 and and uh, I that movie was super underrated totally underrated Highlander I don't know what drugs that dude was smoking to put that on this list 
I would like um, I would like him to tell me so that I never ever ingest them because no, like Highlander is uh, what I didn't even want to get into that, but uh, you're gonna you're gonna cast the Irish or the uh, you're gonna cast the Scottish guy as the Egyptian, and then catch cast the Eastern European as the Scottish guy, and actually have them talk to each other. That is a ballsy move, sirs. However, it does not make that one of the five most unrated movies of all time. Buckaroo Bonsai, though, man. Yes. Yes, dude. All day. And they live. Having that on a list. Honest to God, like, I know maybe today with, like, Carpenter fever having swept and, like, Halloween got remade and yada, yada, yada. But, like, dude, that was a big shout out. And especially they live. That is an awesome movie. And on top of that, I have to apologize. I wish I could find the comment. I have tried repeatedly. Somebody asked me if They Live was directly inspired by a comic book. Now, if if you know anything about They Live, it was originally inspired by a short story, not a comic book. However, that short story, ver- it, it bears very little resemblance at all to they live guy goes to a um hypnotist show guy hypnotizes him and uh i can't remember what he tells him but he's like uh you can see the truth or you can he tells him you can see like through you can see reality you can see the truth and he starts seeing freaking aliens everywhere he doesn't do anything about it i'm pretty sure that's like just the end of the story it's really short uh it's it is a good story but it's not It's kind of a letdown if you go to it after they live. I had someone ask me, is they live directly based on a comic book? Yes, it is. From a story in Alien Encounters number six by Eclipse Comics, I believe. I am going to do a much deeper dive on that. Cartoonist Kayfabe did do a video on that one. If you guys want to check it out, I'll uh, try to remember to include a link in the description below if you want to go and check that out. But I will be doing a nice deep dive on that. I am an inordinate John Carpenter fan. And for anybody who doesn't know, John Carpenter is intrinsically kind of tied to comic books. He's got a number of comic book titles that are coming out at this point. I think a lot of people see that as kind of a cash grab, like uh, maybe an ancillary character Uh, being involved uh, with the industry. It's not true. He is an enormous fan and collector of the original EC pre-code horror stuff. Uh, Not just EC, but, you know, EC and then all of the pre-code horror stuff, uh, Pulps and Wars, science fiction, that kind of stuff. Um, One of the men, the man, I should say, the man mostly instrumental in many of the, in like, most impressive effects from the thing was Mike Plug. Now, Mike Plug was not hired by accident. John Carpenter tracked him down. John Carpenter knows his stuff. Like if you ever see, I highly recommend checking out, um, I cannot believe that this is just sitting right here. Check out the Modern Masters volume by Mike uh, Plug super cool and in here they talk about his work as a storyboard artist and one of the storyboards that they show is from the thing and they show a couple of them but he's the guy who came up essentially with the way that the uh ah there it is he's the guy if you have ever been haunted by that image Mike Plug is the dude who came up with it. And the whole reason that Mike Plug got that job is because John Carpenter knows his ish, man. I'm telling you. Um, so for anybody who ever like sees those John Carpenter comics and they're like, oh, you yeah, faker, faker, or whatever. Dude, I'm telling you, man, Carpenter's been around the block and uh, he definitely knows his stuff. This is, uh, yeah, I'm, it's about uh, Street Fighter 2. 
and a bunch of different consoles. I This never came out, but I literally like laughed so hard when I saw this. This is a the Super NES CD-ROM drives blazing hot and almost complete. No, it's not. Uh, best of my knowledge, that never came out. Sega CD came out. Um, we never got no Super Nintendo CD-ROM, though. Uh, they're having an argument about like whether or not um, you should get Street Fighter on Sega or Super NES. Anybody in the know knows that that is not a question. You should get that on Sega because it is way better. Sorry, guys. I'm a Nintendo guy, but uh, it's better on Sega. They, uh, it, they do make a funny joke about how like uh, they bet that, uh, oh, no, I tore the page. Oh, no, it's not mint condition. <gasps> ah! But how they're probably going to do a turbo edition for Sega because Sega has better graphics. They're like, we're sure, you know, it'll be uh, for the collector's edition. Next, there'll be a turbo edition. And there was, uh, but they really bash on like why they introduced it on the uh, Sega. I don't even want to get into it. Insect politics. I mean, it's just a bunch of crap. This is cool. So this is a conversation a lot of people were having in the mid 90s. If you collect comic books now, like actually collect them, don't just like buy stuff and then put it in a 10 cent bag that you get from your local shop, you know that there are archival and non-archival boards. That was not a, I mean, it was like a secret. Nobody ever thought that those were gonna destroy your books. The, um, I'm gonna do a video because I've, I've recently found out that the, about there is actually a traceable line for the guy who came up with comic book boards and in bags. It is super cool. He ran a uh, mail order and um, to, to keep his books in better condition, he started bagging them and boarding them and he put his name, he used them as a uh, form of advertisement and now those bags and boards are actually collectible. They, however, are not archival, and that's what's cool. Um, they, when I was young and I grew up reading uh, art, like little stuff like this, it is absolutely uh, appealing to the worst side of the collector's market. Like that book that you just bought that you paid $75 for that came out six months ago is dying. It's got to leach all the colors out of it. Chances are the people who were buying their books in the 90s, especially in new books, really didn't hold on to the books. The books really didn't either hold the value or they just didn't take care of them. That's just the God's honest truth. So shelling out for like major protection on your books was not a thing that a lot of people were doing in 1993 on a large scale. It was starting to expand, but it was not something that was like widely done inside of the collector's market. This is super cool because it is a, essentially like, uh, if you remember those like, this is your brain on drugs, your comics are dying. The materials you're using to store your comic books may actually be ruining them. Um, they talk about Mylar and they talk about acid-free backing boards. They point out two fallacies that are still um, perpetrated to this day stuff that is sprayed with UV or archival uh, backing because that rubs off. It's proven to rub off within maybe six months, tops or degrade. And then your book is just getting eaten away by these cheap backing boards. And a lot of the boards you could buy at this point were highly acidic and would, they, I mean, they would torture comics. I have seen comics um, when I used to help at the local shop with like bringing in collections and that kind of stuff. I, I don't do that much anymore, but during the late 90s especially, there were these like thick, just, I mean, they were gnarly thick plastic bags. And if you had one, you know what I'm talking about. Cause like you literally probably couldn't cut them with scissors and they looked super badass. I remember I put a couple of books into them until I saw these collections come in and they literally had burned acid holes into the front of the book. That's how acidic um, that some of those, uh, plastics were now, this is run by a dude who's like, this is what, uh, this, the, um, national archive uses to preserve all their stuff. Bill Cole enterprises. Now, Bill Cole 
finally retired, ooh, I think maybe like 2008, something like that. Bill Cole, however, is an extremely pivotal dude. Bill Cole is the guy that was so synonymous with comic book production, CGC contracted him to make the archival uh, sleeves, the Mylar sleeves that CGC gives out with their slabs. Those are Bill Cole Enterprise bags. Um, they were designed by Bill Cole, I think in like 2003. And um, to the best of my knowledge, they're still Bill Cole stuff. Um, okay, guys, I'm sorry. I don't play video games. Don't give a crap about any of this. I did read it. It's just utter nonsense. Death, mate. Oh, it's like it's taunting me. Make the video. Make the video. I will. I will, guys. Don't worry. I don't even want... Let's not talk about Maximum Force. Jesus, dude. I love Simon Bisley so freaking much. And it's like, for anybody who can't figure out why the hell no one talks about Trencher anymore, Heath Giffen Trencher poster in the first issue of Atomica's Maximum Force... Yeah, it didn't have wonderful associations. I don't know why Trencher never got pushed, man. The series is amazing. Yeah, I said amazing. Keith Giffen's absolutely brilliant. And I don't give a crap what anybody says. Or what era it is. Because that dude, like, every five years, at least, like, if not every three years, is like, no, I'm tired of drawing like that. I'm going to completely reinvent myself. And it's always freaking good. I don't know how he does it. So, trading cards are huge in 1993. I mean, absolutely monstrous, right? Not going to get, like, super derailed. I don't want to get off on a huge tangent, I guess. However, I have to go into this article just a little bit because, like, it made me laugh so much. Like, nowadays, it seems like people are almost inventing reasons to collect comic books. Now, I'm not saying they're not valid, okay? But like, uh, I think best example I can come up with is the newsstands. So like newsstands for us, for Image Comics specifically, are considered to be about one in 100 ratios. So for one newsstand, you have a hundred direct market copies. Um, so obviously the newsstand, which has this slightly different barcode on it, is going to be much more valuable. Uh, actually, I should have... I suppose I could accurately show you all this with an actual book that I have on my table that somebody commented about um, that used to be garbage. So newsstands, um, they'll have like the direct copies will have, they'll say a uh, direct market on them. I think this might even be way beyond that. Cause I don't even think they have, they say direct edition up here now, but, um, so for every, say these were the same comic, right? For every hundred of these, there'd be one of these newsstands. And today, like people are saying these newsstands are rare enough. And this is like, say th this is the uh, first ever Scarlet Spider uh, standalone issue. So like, I think this may be even like in this condition, a $10 comic book now. Newsstand, direct market. I mean, it's cool. Like if, that, if that's your bag, I'm not burning on you. What I'm saying is, is that there are such minute details. It takes an inordinate amount of research to find out about that stuff. With the internet, it is a lot easier. You can have somebody, one guy figures it out. He kind of points it out. Everybody else is onto it. Like, you know, oh yeah, this is super cool. This is a whole new subset. Trust me, I'm into that stuff. Um, I collect, uh, I want to have a full run of the Max newsstands. Now, I was collecting those before the newsstands kicked off because I bought all my Max uh, comics off the newsstand. And those barcodes that you see, like they're pretty intrinsic to the way that I remember those covers looking. They're not, they're messed with. There's something about them that doesn't feel complete, like the collection that I have, the run that I have. So back in the day, though, you literally had to rely on someone else to do your information. This is a really well-written article about trading cards. They actually point out this is a super in-depth look at the 1992 Toy Biz line, and it's crazy. There's three subsets, right? So they show you like the differences on the back. 
and there are like some slight differences on the front or whatever, but they actually go to the point of figuring out that there was a color change that it was these cards, but they had red was the regular set that you could get, I believe. And these gray ones only came in action figures on the blister packs. And there was one to a pack, but they didn't come with like Apocalypse didn't come with Apocalypse. Apocalypse came with all these different cards, but they all had these gray subset printings on them. What is absolutely berserk is that the entire set got printed. And they say even at the time, the 100 card set would cost you more than $700 to assemble. That shows you the level of speculation that was going on right around this time. I mean, that's abs to even think that someone would spend $700 on action figures for not the act to open them to get the cards is insane. Eh, price guide. I don't even really want to get into it. There's some cool stuff on here, but it's cards. Uh, go figure. Yeah, no, I'm not even going to monkey with it. There's some like uh, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers stuff. Bunch of Star Trek. There's a Last Action Hero that's kicking off. Uh, hottest top 10 heroes. I don't know, man. You can look back at this and just kind of laugh. Oh, there's a nice one, though. Sienkiewicz uh, doing that saber tooth run. I think that was Sienkiewicz. It would either have been Sienkiewicz or Mark Texier right around there, or Texera. I don't quite know how you say his name, embarrassingly enough. They keep talking about spawn, like, hey, you should pick up early spawns because those will probably stick around in value. Savage Dragon 1 is just because, if you don't remember, Savage Dragon launched as a mini-series. Savage Dragon 1 is getting ready to come out. Uh, they're hyping that up. Cyber Force, meh. They got the Image uh, Valiant Deathmate prologue is getting ready to come out. I don't think the last of the Deathmate stuff saw publication until like the beginning of 1995 into 1994. It is ridiculous. These are the reader top 10s. So X-Men number one, obviously, first. Uh, Spawns number two, uh, yeah, okay. Then you got um, Sandman at number three. That was pretty cool. I was like, okay, interesting. Number uh, four is the uh, Amazing Spider-Man with, um, I mean, it's that anniversary issue, the gold cover with uh, Spider-Man and Venom fighting on the front with uh, Anne Wang in it. Uh, Death of Superman. Then they get to number six and they're like Wolverine and they're like, yeah, uh, you should check out this uh, Marvel Comics Presents run by this weird dude, Sam Keith, maybe. A lot of people like it. We don't get it. I'm like, guys, they, I mean, they're pretty complimentary of everything else. I don't understand. It's just like, I feel like whoever wrote this magazine did not like Sam Keith's art very much, which is fairly upsetting, dude. It just seems like they're short shrift in him, man. Like that, that, dude, those Wolverine runs and those Marvel Comics presents, those are pretty impressive to look at. What is this? Ooh, original mailer. Let's, let's subscribe, guys. I want to subscribe i want to i want to i actually want to fill this out and send it in oh and this is interesting on all of these solicitations circle uh 106 on the card so you just circle it and they would send you information on uh those those uh retailers that's actually that's actually pretty interesting wow i couldn't i apologize when i was reading this for the life of me i could not figure out what the hell um, all of that was about, I was like, why am I circling anything? Reader Roundtable. So let, yeah, let's talk about this. Um, Reader Roundtable is pretty interesting. I find it interesting that, uh, Hero Illustrated had the balls to publish this. Reader Roundtable absolutely lays waste to, uh, to, to, it just obliterates everything that was going on with the industry. Uh, that like this first one, I don't like gimmick covers. Why do they keep trying to make me buy the same cover with different or the same comic with different covers? This is bull crap. Just do one cover or, you know, have, you know, a giveaway, whatever you want, but you can't keep trying to get me to buy multiple comics just for the cover. It's stupid. Uh, this is a big problem we're running into again, guys, with ratio variants and A's and B's and it's, it's just madness. It is. 
It's a slippery slope. It is one of the problems that really bit the comic industry in the ass in the 90s. And uh, that I, that I, that's why I really wanted to go through this reader roundtable. Um, I know I come off like this old f***ing curmudgeon a lot of times where I'm just angry and crusty and I'm like, you young kids, and this is stay off my lawn and stop paying for those previews magazines. They're not first appearances. It's not what it's about, man. Like I, I love the comic industry and uh, I almost saw them die once. And if you guys look at the freaking circulation numbers back then, you will understand that when the industry bottomed out, when they basically couldn't afford to publish books anymore, Marvel declared bankruptcy, all of that crap, they were publishing about as many books as they are now on their biggest books. Like 40 to 70,000 books is big now. That's nuts. That's crazy. X-Men number one sold 10 million copies. This one is interesting. They are complaining there's way too many titles. However, what they don't go into is a bunch of like uh, independent publishers. And they specifically single out, like they do say that Malibu is putting out a few too many books and Image needs to dial back and, you know, concentrate on quality. Dark Horse probably should just start publishing some books that he likes, which I don't agree with. I think Dark Horse is putting out some good stuff at all points. And at this point, they, I think they had acquired Madman. Madman might have still been out at Tundra, but he's close. But they, and he just says, Marvel's making me pick and choose which titles to read. And I remember that. I remember being like younger and you could read Batman. And the older I got, got a little bit more expensive, but it never got crazy. And Spider-Man was my other dude. When I was a kid, I could read all the Spider-Man books. And as I got older, I could not afford all the Spider-Man books. Like people ask me why I'm so salty about the Clone Saga, man. Like, that was all just tie-ins and just book after book. And I was a Spider-Man guy and I couldn't afford all of it. And then by the time I wasted all this money, it's this lackluster story they drug on for months because they didn't really have a plan. It's very synonymous with what's going on with the 90s market. Commercialism, uh, multiple covers and gimmicks. Again, to know that that got published like bam, bam, like they had to separate it up with another letter because that's one of the major complaints they got. That should tell you, dude. People were getting salty about it even back then. Uh, this is one ram ramming on the uh, summer blockbuster deals. You know, the crossovers that everybody decided they had to start doing. Um, God knows Louise Simonson wishes she could go back in time probably and stop that from ever going down. It's, oh, yeah. Okay. I forgot about this one. There's too many crossover stories. This is getting right back into what I was talking about. Because like with Spider-Man... Like with the Clone Saga, dude, you had like uh, Spider-Man, Spectacular Spider-Man, Amazing Spider-Man. I'm pretty sure Web of Spider-Man was still going on. There were minis that tied into this. And then there were other titles that tied into the Clone Saga, dude. It was just like, I couldn't afford it, man. It felt like I was, I just couldn't afford it. I couldn't read it. And then by the time that I did pick up a lot of it, it's just, it was so la it was so unimpressive that I was really angry about it. Oh, wow. This one is pretty interesting. Something we're dealing with, very, it's so funny how cyclical history can be. This is talking about a problem. Well, it's not a problem. Not a problem. I'm sorry. This is talking about a situation that we're dealing with again today. Now, when Superman died, if if you weren't alive or you were too young, then it's not going to have the impact that it that it really should. Because legit, when Superman died, and I'm not joking, it was a big freaking deal. It was in the New York Times. Everybody did all these write-ups about it, dude. It was it it was big big news. They sold so many comics. Tons of people came in that had never come into a comic shop ever before. And this is a very interesting article about 
what retailers and specifically uh, Pat Brower from Graham Crackers Comics, uh, Graham Cracker Comics. No, it is Graham Crackers Comics. Is it Graham Crackers? I always thought it was Graham Cracker Comics. Anyway, how do you get those people to stay? The people that come in, they pick up that issue, but then they come back. What do you get them into? How do you get them hooked? How do you show them that there's more than just this gimmicky stuff like Superman dying and the reign of Superman with all the return and, the, and all of that stuff? It's a very interesting article. And basically what he gets down to is finding books that appeal to your target demographic and knowing what's in your store and being uh, amiable and um, knowledgeable and I know that sounds all like, why the hell would you even say that? We'll go into a comic ship, you know, go into a comic book store. Those guys, many times, I'm very lucky. My local comic, you know, my local stores are, uh, f for the most part, very helpful. You know, I can go in and I can I can talk to them. And one of the things that they bring up a lot of times is uh, uh, Black Panther is a really great example. How do you get people that are uh, young uh, females or young African-Americans that have never been into a store that uh, oftentimes feel very out of place. You know, if you don't know where to start, if you don't have an idea of where to point those, uh, those folks to besides like, well, there's Black Panther. Ah, you know, it's, you've got, Plenty of stuff now, Miles Morales and tons of the uh, the, the newer age characters. Um, I can't I can't remember what they call the those characters, but uh, the the new wave of Marvel, the younger characters. You got a ton of those guys that you can point to, but you have to know about that stuff. You have to know how to talk people into staying into the store. Oh, this was super freaking crazy! So limited edition treasure, uh, limited treasured editions. Uh, Proudly presents, blah, blah, blah. It's all these sign and autograph stuff. Yeah, whatever, you know, a bunch of crap that I didn't care about. Ren and Stimpy book and all of that. Down here at the bottom, Sandman number 50 with a freaking Matt Green, or uh, with a Neil Gaiman uh, sketch and um, P. Craig Russell sketch. I was like, oh, dude, that is ridiculous. I, I looked those up and it turns out they were prints. Because they make them sound like actually you're going to get like an actual print in there. Focus on image. This is about as close as they get. Um, you can see, wow, look at how whopping that is. Three, well, actually two and a half, not even three pages. Very cool. I like this article. They don't pull punches. They talk about how image is late. It's style over substance, but that that's not something to be ashamed about. And it's not something that's necessarily bad that the marketplace has obviously made a demand for that kind of book and that they're just filling that demand. Uh, they put split, uh, spitting image out there or splitting image, is it? They publish their own, you know, uh, parody magazine. It's not like harsh, harsh biting criticism or anything, but they're realistic about the company. And I respect the fact that they weren't necessarily writing that like image bandwagon of hey these guys can do no wrong that's about it they do have a pretty whacked out freaking let's get in the price guide we'll talk about the price guide for two seconds i'm not gonna drag you guys you know there's a reason we're gonna talk about it up until now we've had a bunch of really cool contests you could win uh t-shirts and uh there's like a you could win i think you win tickets to the super tour and um like uh i think if something having to do with this you can win a uh, platinum Superman, uh, Death of Superman, and uh, there's original art, and uh, I mean, there's just been a ton of crap so far, right? So, like, you get back here, and first of all, I really like this. They have picked out, like, hero tip keys. I'm not saying that I necessarily, like, think that, oh, yeah, they made very wise decisions, and those books have definitely all gone up in value. But having books that are actually like, this is John Byrne's uh, first work on the X-Men. And it happens in the back of Marvel team up number 53. Uh, there's like zero movement on this book at this point. Like today, there's, you know, not a lot of spec uh, because everybody wants uh, Byrne's first work on X-Men in X-Men, which is cool. Uh, I own this book. This is the kind of thing that I would thumb through the Overstreet just 
reading over my favorite titles and looking at the little information they had and like that was the kind of stuff that i definitely picked up on so it's cool to see stuff like that and they do have some nice calls man daredevil 158 that's the first frank miller they're also eerily kind of on a lot about their calls like this book has gone up for jack spit you know it's pretty important daredevil dude right there if this price is at all accurate 40 dollars, you're talking about 45 dollars today for a mint copy it's like no movement but that is one of the for me i think i have four of them at this point because i just can't pass them up and you see them at great prices if i see a good condition copy i snap it up it's the first frank miller freaking daredevil man it's awesome so uh let's see these are the comic contest uh, introductions. Now, this one, Daredevil number one. Next page, Black Error edition of Venom number one. Uh, or of, uh, of Venom number one. Yes, I'm sorry. They actually they do say Venom number one, don't they? We all know that series is called Lethal Protector, Uncle Jerk. I think one of their picks, the geeks up here, um, oh no, it's not one of their picks. I forgot. No, it's even cooler than that. So yeah, you can get a, uh, black error edition. Another crazy thing. If you look at the prices, about $350 for a high, high grade copy. These days you'd be paying about $350 for a high grade copy. These guys, I, it, I don't know if these guys were just like a million years ahead of the game or what's going on. They uh, have some interesting call Cerebus number 21. This is one of the first times I remember reading. Uh, the reason they picked number 21 has nothing to do with first appearances or anything like that. It's low print run. They point out that they looked at the print run and the print run at that point had shrunk and eventually grew again. So that was book was going to be in demand for people putting together sets. So... They send you, like, you can win a signed copy from Dave Sim. It's like, dang, dude, these guys are pulling out all the stuff. Um, Unity Zero, this book, holy crap, man. I can't believe you can still find people who will pay 75, 80 bucks for one of these. If you get on eBay, you can see them up. I don't know if they sell. I didn't really look that hard. But you can find them for, like, couple hundred dollars graded man i've seen nine eights for like three or four hundred dollars and it it's ridiculous like those books are literally just they tell you what happened in the previous uh valiant books because everything all kind of like convalesced unity was supposed to be the big first like tie together that explained how the universe worked um conan number one this is one that's pretty interesting it's about the same price now and it's cool because on a lot of these they tell you they're like these are just good solid books that if you like collecting if you want a good book that's got a good reason for being a key here you go probably not going to go up a whole heck of a lot here's why conan's another one of those books um it's seen some movement over the last like whatever two years because uh marvel got conan back finally so, you know, if you need one, you can win one from Hero One. I really, w I almost wish I'd have picked this up off the stand when I was a kid and just, I could I could have won one of these. This is one of the, like, yeah, Magnus uh, Robot, uh, number 21 gold, who gives a toss about that. Now, I have no idea what the deal was with Magnus Robot Fighter number zero. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Was never into that series. But uh, that book still goes for not so amount of monies. Nexus. Super. I am like. Farther I got into this, more I like this magazine. That was one of these. One, this is one of the things where I was like, yes, I very, very freaking much like your magazines. Because um, Nexus is a $2 book. And they're like, is this book going to go up? No, probably not. Is it an amazing book? Yes, and you should be reading it because it is freaking awesome. That is absolutely true. Uh, the, you know, Steve, the rude dude is just, I mean, he is a god to me. Poor, depressed bastard. 
Fantasy Quarterly, uh, Elf Quest just ain't done junk, man. I really want to do a good piece on on Elf Quest. I would love to try to track down. I'm trying to track down the peenies. I would love to talk to them about it. There we go. Batman Grendel signed Platinum Hero Ashcan number two. Now, this is the one, and even though it has a red background like this shows, pretty sure it had a gray background. And there were like 25 of them signed. Yeah, those things are, they're, they truly are for like Grendel collectors. They're grails, man. Pretty cool. Could win one of those in this first issue. Watchman number one is another pick. $5 comic. They're like, hey, probably not going to go up. But you know what? Definitely worth snatching up. Because it's freaking Watchmen. First introduction of Amazing Spider-Man's parents. Oh, Pete's parents. For those of you who didn't live through the 90s, just thank yourselves. You don't have to know who they are. Spies. Good God, that was just ridiculous. So it's got a hero rating of zero, like one. Uh, when a, an amazing Spider-Man Platinum, that one, uh, that book is definitely worth a little bit of uh, of uh, dough these days too. Um, it's gonna be a special edition of Aliens vs Predator. This was one of the ones that I would have thought as a, that would have like picked up steam. Marvel preview number two. This is the first uh, origin of Punisher, real origin, and it's the first ever solo Punisher, too. It's like 185 at this point, and like today you can get mints for right around like 175, which is crazy to me. I would have thought that book would have exploded. Um, I'm actually, I'm probably going to pick one up, sell a couple of books, and maybe snag one up. Holy crap, I think this might have been the book that Comic Insider was telling you to get was the Savage Namor. Yeah, uh, New Direction. This one, though. Okay. You have all of the stuff that they give away that's not, you know, Silver Age Marvel stuff, like Amazing Fantasy 15 and Incredible Hulk 1. Oh, and they give away a uh, X-Men number 1, too, I'm pretty sure. Just to round things out. First printing, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number 1. I mean, God. Now, this one, they were way off the mark. I mean, way off. They say that, like, uh, Turtle Mania has hit its proliferation point. Uh, it's a good book to pick up if you get a pr good price on it because it'll hold prestige, but that the height of Turtle popularity has most definitely come and gone. As the last two years can attest, um, and the prices on those Jenica first appearances and the uh, last Ronin books. I mean, those are contemporary books. This, oh God, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number one, guys. Brace yourselves. It's like 300 bucks. $2.95. Yeah. Can you imagine that? Did you take a, a mint condition Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number one? for 290 bucks god dang those things are like 10 grand now and they were giving well they were giving one away i mean legit that is one of the few ever that's one of the few contemporary comics that can literally throw down with silver age marvel super cool this one was kind of like reaching they love mike already you can tell um as we talked about earlier he was relaunching i'm not gonna flip through there Keep trying to do that, doesn't work. So earlier we discussed that the Geek was getting relaunched by Mike Allred. Um, they got an original, the Geek, uh, Brother of the Power of the Geek, that is. Um, and uh, who's it? Joe Simon, yeah, of course. Right in front of me again, Joe Simon uh, originally did the book. So Mike Allred signed it for you because you need a Mike Allred signed Brotherhood of the Geek, I guess. Peter David's first ever uh, work on um, X Factor. They're recommending you pick that up. So that's surefire bet. Um, X Men 300. There's the freaking X Men one. I mean, I just can't. Like, I really want to know did somebody own a comic shop 
This is pretty interesting, though. 15 bucks. Batman Vengeance of Bane. This is the highest rating they give any of the books in here. It's the one that they say, this is like a surefire, low print run. Pick it up. It's going to be important. Obviously, I think they're just specking on it being part of the, uh, you know, Knight's Quest thing with Batman getting his back broken. But man, if you had one of these in good condition, you know you're sitting on a heck of a book these days. They've got a... Uh, Batman 500 signed by Joe Quesada. It's funny because they're like, yeah, we know we said we didn't really have any details about it because the book's not even out and we don't know what Batman's going to look like, but we're sure it's going to be so cool that you're going to want a copy of it signed by Joe Quesada instead of like X-Men number one. Because who would want that? There was a Pressman variant of this book where the, um, I think the writing's red and this is gold, but uh, dude, that book is fire right now ooh, masterful uh masterful cards uncut sheet used to do uncut sheets of cards all the time back in the day for contests that was one of the cool things actually um i guess i didn't really talk about it because i really tried to breeze through there but um one of the interesting things in the card section was um they're like uncut sheets for a lot of stuff is pretty interesting like diamond promo set uh preview uncut sheet there's a yeah with press sheet it's pretty cool man like back in the day you could get those for a bunch of stuff they don't they didn't uh they weren't easy to take care of so now some of those are not easy to come by they're not real expensive or anything but they're cool to come by um and you saw them giving away mostly in contests and stuff like this you can really buy them they came like maybe on top of a box and stuff Spawn number four, I mean, that's just way overrated. It's $7.50 for that book. There's no way anyone's going to pay you a dollar for that book. Superman 75 Direct, look at that price. $40 freaking dollars, dude. Can you imagine being able to get $40 out of a comic? Now, this is like, I don't know why they stuck this in like a little tiny... I mean, it's right next to this. I know why it relates, but... Can high-run books retain long-term collector value? No. Let me tell you that. No. Um, back in the day, yes. Because people did not take care of their comic books. They didn't collect comic books. They didn't do jack with their comic books. Today, heck no. There are people who bought 10, 15, and I don't mean like Rich people, I mean like Joe Schmoes, lots of them bought 10 or 15 copies of a lot of this stuff and put it into a box in a bag and a board and saved it, took pristine care of it. And now, 30 years later, they can't understand why they can't get $4 out of it when they paid 10, 15, 20, 30, $40 for it. They, they start, they're, they're pretty logical about it, actually. They're like, yes, they can retain value in the short term because they're like, look at Superman 75. But then what happens when everybody turns around to sell that? You know, and that's what happened. That that was the implosion of the 90s market is people finally decided like, oh man, I'd really like to get off of this like $80 copy of Wildcats number one. Because who really, man? I mean, like Jim Lee is awesome, but like Wildcats, you want to spend $80 on a Wildcats comic. Like, legit, you could get, like, back then, you could get real first appearance, Silver Age first appearances for, like, 150 bucks. Really? You could pay 80 bucks for a Wildcats gold. And then, and the thing was, is, like, the what irked me as a kid, even, like, and I enjoy collecting some of this, so don't get me wrong, I'm not, like, bagging on owning this stuff. I just don't understand paying $80. Like, this cover might be awesome if i was a wildcats fan yeah i'd want it for part of the collection i'd pay maybe 15 bucks for it it's very indicative of the of the, of the market to me so whatever i get maybe it's because i don't care about wildcats oh geez i guess that's about it so um yeah i guess like that was the last big contest is the x-men number one i i can't conceive the amount 
in comic books that they're giving away in this. Like that Incredible Hulk number one, if that, if that was in good condition, you're talking about some major dollars. Okay, guys, I'm going to go get something to scratch this off, and we will see if we win a Spider-Man number one. There we go. Star, star, DC, star. I don't know what that means. Nope. Nope. So, at least that's good. Because uh, if we'd have won something, I might have actually been kind of pissed off. Like, uh, that would have been sad for somebody who didn't get uh, didn't get their comics back in the day, at least. So, thanks so much for tuning in, guys. Uh, I hope you guys are enjoying these. Well, this one isn't going to be shorter. But I hope you guys are enjoying these uh, easier videos for me to do. I am working on the Bernard Krigstein video right now. And I got another interview coming up. And then hopefully we're going to have that Sam Keith Max video part two out ASAP. So thanks so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed, maybe even learned something. If you did like this, please do me a favor, hit that like button. Think about sharing these videos with your friends. If you really enjoyed what you saw, Hulk smash that subscribe button. If you do that, make sure you dang the little notification bell so you keep up with these videos that I'm dropping all the time. Thanks so much for sticking with me again. I hope you enjoyed, maybe even learned something. And as always, I really, truly, and honestly ask only two things. Keep hitting those local shops and keep reading comics.